My name is Joey McCollum. Uh, I am a research associate at Virginia Tech. And tonight I would like to share with you some research that I've been conducting for the last two or three years. Uh, and it's on a machine learning technique called non-negative matrix factorization and how it can be applied to the task of classifying New Testament manuscripts into groups. So I guess just to start with a little roadmap, uh, I'm gonna start with some of the basics, uh, just stuff we need to know. And uh, then I'm gonna give a little bit of a historical overview of some methodologies that are gonna be relevant to the, the work that I've done. So you'll kind of get like a little bit of a history of textual criticism lesson and I'm going to use that to sort of illustrate some of the some of the ways that this method works. Hey, Joey. Yeah. Are you, are you able to uh, either sit closer to your mic or oh. in any way? Yeah, yeah, probably. I think the mic is up here somewhere. Is that better? The, the D students in the back corner over there uh, are having trouble here. Kind of <laughs> oh, sorry. I could try to be louder. <laughs> All right. Um, so. I guess let's get started. So before we can get to that question of how we even classify manuscripts, we have to answer a much more basic question, which is how do we compare them? And uh, the way we do that is through collation. So Dr. Gurry has informed me that you guys have been working on a homework exercise uh, on collation this last week. So you should understand most of the basics. Uh, the goal here is to align the text as found in different manuscripts as, uh, as closely as possible. And after that, you'll have places left over where there are still differences. We call those places variation units. And the uh, different readings that are found in different manuscripts of those places are called variant readings. So I found that uh, a really great uh, resource to illustrate this process in action is uh, Reuben Swanson's volumes uh, of collation data on the New Testament. So right here, I've, I have a screenshot of his volume on Luke, and we're in Luke 10 here, but you can see how uh, right-hand side here, we have all the manuscript witnesses, but you can see that uh, he's lined up all of these variant texts, and you can see that where there are differences, he highlights them very nicely for you. So you can see substitutions of wording underlined, you can see sort of spaces where there are additions or omissions, and uh, you'll also notice that for some witnesses like Papyrus 75 in the second row here, you have a bunch of dots in place of letters or entire words. And what that represents is that that witness has a, what we call a lacuna or a gap. So there's either damage done to the page or for whatever reason, the, uh, the text is illegible and we couldn't make it out. And then here's the same uh, collation, but with the variation units highlighted and indexed for convenience. So uh, once we've collated everything, we have a very easy way to calculate the similarity of any two given manuscripts. We simply just count up the number of variation units where they have the same reading. Now, if we want to have this in a proportion like between zero and 100%, then we would just divide that count by the number of variation units where uh, the readings of both of those witnesses are known. That is to say, where neither one has a lacuna. So. <laughs> in the coherence-based genealogical method, which you may not have learned about yet, but this is Dr. Gurry's class, so you probably will learn about it at a later point. They will, and they can't wait. So. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> this falls under a category that we would call pre-genealogical coherence. Uh, the key phrase there is pre-genealogical. And uh, the important thing to know about that is that what we're measuring uh, is just the degree of similarity or dissimilarity between manuscripts, and we're not saying anything about the direction of their relationship. So we're not saying that this manuscript is earlier than that one, or uh, it's prior to that one. Uh, we'll start seeing how similar they are. So with uh, now that we have a metric in hand for uh, determining the similarity of manuscripts, how can we use that to classify manuscripts into groups? Well, to answer that question, uh, we have to start in the early 60s uh, with uh, two gentlemen by the name of Ernest, Ernest Caldwell and Ernest Toon. And they came up with a method that we now call the quantitative method. And it really consists of two basic criteria for determining if a given set of manuscripts 
constitutes a family or what we would call a text type. So you can see them detailed right down here. The first criterion really is just a way of, of capturing the intuition that a family of manuscripts should be close knit. And the second criterion captures the idea that groups should be well separated. Uh, we shouldn't have groups bleeding into one another um, because that would kind of defeat the purpose. And uh, you, you can see this illustrated down here in, in this uh, diagram. So the data points here represent manuscripts and they're color coded, uh, color -coded according to the groups that they've been classified into. And you'll see that most of the manuscripts or data points are pretty close within the same group, but you'll also notice that there are identifiable gaps between them. And you know, that, that is the ideal scenario. Unfortunately, uh, we're working in the real world and things aren't that simple. So there are a couple problems with the method, you know, just formulated with no refinements. And the first one is that not all variation units are created equal. So uh, one of the phenomenon that occurs very often with New Testament manuscript data is that we will often have cases where most or all other manuscripts would agree on like some reading, but there's one manuscript that has what we call a singular reading. And usually that's going to be a common scribal error, like a misspelling or a nonsense reading. And really, these kinds of variation are not informative. First of all, because the one manuscript that has the singular reading, it doesn't tell us anything about its grouping. And if all the other manuscripts agree on some other reading, then we can't distinguish them either. And the effect of this really is that uh, it, it causes us to overestimate similarity if we include uh, these kinds of variation units. Another problem is that uh, in the tradition of the New Testament, uh, contamination or mixture of sources was a tenacious problem. So in the ideal scenario, we would expect a scribe to copy faithfully from just one manuscript. Um, but sometimes uh, a scribe might have been playing the textual critic and might have been using two or more different manuscripts and then picking and choosing from those the readings that they deem best. Um, a more subtle scenario might be a scribe trying to copy from just one manuscript, but in the back of their head, they are familiar with a more common text found in other manuscripts that they've copied or uh, the kind of text that they've heard read in church. And that might creep into what they're copying or influence it. And uh, the effect of this can be seen in this diagram down here. So you'll see that here I've actually highlighted a few data points or manuscripts that sit in between clusters and don't really fit neatly into any of them. And in fact, uh, with real world data, this effect is even more pronounced, so much so that scholars have more recently questioned whether we should be talking about text types as hard groups at all. And in fact, Caldwell himself realized that there were certain problems with the method that would have to be overcome in order for it to work. And he, he proposed some sort of pre-processing steps that could be taken to improve things. So one of them, and the most important, would really be to focus our attention on the most informative points of variation. Um, so you know, ignoring most of those places where there are singular readings or uninformative types of changes. Um, and even beyond that, within those variation units that are left over, we want to focus on the most informative readings in them. So down here you see uh, Reuben Swanson's collation again, but uh, if we look at the readings in variation unit one here, we can see that Ethan uh, is a very informative reading because it is exclusively shared by the manuscripts of family one here. The other reading, Elegan, uh, is shared by everyone else. And so it really doesn't help us distinguish other groups. Um, it also turns out that if you're able to isolate the most informative readings this way, um, you can handle the problem of uh, classifying a newly discovered manuscript way faster because all you have to do then is just check that manuscript at all of those uh, significant points in the text where they're uh, where there are important readings, rather than having to transcribe out the entire text and then compare that entire text to the entire text of every other manuscript at every point. Uh, 
the only question now is, you know, how do we figure out what those most informative readings are? Well, to answer that question, we've got to fast forward to about 1982, uh, when a scholar by the name of Frederick Wissa uh, applied a methodology that was developed in Claremont back in the late 60s to uh, what was then a very new uh, collation of manuscripts of Luke done by the International Greek New Testament Project. So the method is called the Claremont Profile Method, uh, and here's how it works. You, uh, you want to start out with an established set of manuscript groups. Um, usually just, uh, it could be of limited scope, but you'd want to get it from somewhere like uh, existing literature, or you could use another method to find them. But then you're going to apply that pre-processing that Caldwell talked about, you know, weeding out the variation units that aren't informative, and then looking at the readings inside them. And what you're gonna do then is you wanna find the readings that are more or less exclusively shared by the manuscripts in those groups that you established. And those readings are going to be said to belong to that group's profile. Um, so looking back to this example, you'll see we have Swanson's data again, but now I've uh, overlaid um, or highlighted the readings that Wissa identified as uh, important for those groups with, or being belonging to some groups profiles. And Epen, of course, would belong to the profile of family one. So it, the thing we can most readily see is that this uh, allows us to uh, overcome some of the problems that we ran into with uh, the quantitative method. Uh, namely, you know, we can solve that problem of figuring out what the most important points of variation are because that's what this method does. Um, it finds the readings that uh, capture the essence of a group. Um, and as a side bonus or a side benefit, uh, it is also robust to a certain type of mixture. So when Wissa applied the Claremont profile method to Luke, he applied it in three places, Luke chapter one, Luke chapter 10, and Luke chapter 20. And what he discovered uh, when he checked manuscripts was that several manuscripts uh, that had one profile in Luke 1 would have a completely different profile by Luke 10 or Luke 20. And he ascribed that to, to what's called block mixture. And the best way to envision block mixture is uh, like picture a scribe who's copying from one exemplar for a while, but then for whatever reason stops partway through the book and switches over to a different exemplar with a different text type and then keeps copying. And what you get is this like weird Franken manuscript that has you know, different aspects of different texts. Well, the Claremont profile method can detect that because it's being applied in different places. Um, the biggest limitation is that assumption that I, I said at the beginning of the previous slide. In order for this method to work, you have to have groups of manuscripts established first. And now you can kind of see that we have a, a sort of chicken and egg problem here. In the quantitative method, uh, it behooves us to have informative sets of readings that will help us classify manuscripts into groups. But according to the Claremont profile method, in order to figure out what those readings are, it's helpful for us to have uh, manuscript groups established already. So we have a circular relationship. And it's with that impasse that uh, my research picks up. So non-negative matrix factorization leverages that circular relationship between manuscripts and their readings in order to classify both of them. So uh, the first thing we have to talk about is how do we encode our collation data? And well, you can see at the top here, it's called non-negative matrix factorization. So, you know, we're going to use matrices. What's a matrix? A matrix, uh, for our purposes, is best described as a table. So you can see one illustrated here on the right-hand side. This, once again, is Ruben Swanson's collation data, but put in the form of a matrix. And you'll see here that every row corresponds to a variant reading, and every column corresponds to a manuscript. If a manuscript has that reading, we give it a 1 in that entry. Generally, a manuscript will have exactly one reading in a variation unit, but in some cases, like with Papyrus 75 at unit three, it, there's a lacuna, so it doesn't have any reading. Uh, 
Now, uh, the idea behind non-negative matrix factorization is that we want to reconstruct that original matrix uh, representing our collation as a product of two smaller matrices. And before I get into what those other two matrices uh, mean, uh, I'll get to this next uh, bullet point here. What, the only other thing that you have to input besides your collation data is a number K. Uh, and what that number represents is the number of underlying profiles or groups you expect to find in the data. And we'll talk about how you can figure that out at all in, in a bit. So now uh, that, that parameter really affects uh, the shape and size of the two matrices that we're going to be multiplying. So the left-hand matrix, which we just denote W, has uh, one row for every variant reading, just like the original matrix. But now, instead of having a column for every manuscript, it has a column for every group or profile. And so what that matrix represents is uh, it, it tells us the composition of our profiles in terms of the readings that belong to them. And then the right-hand matrix, H, uh, has a column for every manuscript like the original matrix does. But instead of having a row for every reading, it has a row for every profile. And that describes for us the composition of the manuscripts. So this is like the hardest part of, this is the hardest part of this presentation because I have to describe to you how a matrix product works without using linear algebra. And so the best way I thought of doing that was with a picture. So at the top here, uh, we have a graph uh, sort of with three tiers of objects. And you can see that there's two types of relationships here, and they are what are represented by those left-hand and right-hand matrices. So the W matrix tells us the relationship of readings to profiles. And you'll notice that uh, these relationships are weighted. And this is important because we want to capture something that the Claremont profile method does, where you can have primary uh, group readings that are more or less exclusive to that group, and you could also have secondary readings that belong to maybe two or three groups, but not too many. Um, and the weighting allows you to kind of capture that idea of priority. And you can, you'll notice that it is possible for some readings to belong to more than one profile um, and di offer different contributions to them. Similarly, uh, the H matrix captures relationships between the profiles and our manuscripts. Now, the relationship between a profile and manuscript will be generally pretty strong if that manuscript is a pure representative of that group. Uh, in some cases, though, a manuscript might be mixed, and we see that it would have different degrees of contribution from multiple profiles. So what happens uh, when you multiply those two matrices together is that you end up with uh, just a set of relationships going directly from readings to manuscripts, and they kind of tell you uh, sort of this total weight of a contribution that you get after kind of accumulating readings at profiles and then spreading them out to manuscripts. Um, so it's like a weighted, uh, <laughs> a weighted combination of weighted combinations. Um, in your original matrix, uh, like I said, you're going to have zeros and ones just for where those uh, relationships occur. But in the, uh, in the product of these two matrices, uh, it's not going to be quite the same, but you want to approximate it as closely as you possibly can. Does that all make sense? This is the place that I figured it would be the hardest, but OK. We're good? All right, sweet. All right, so um, I'm just going to talk about the algorithm that does this from a high level. Um, and to do that, I only really need to talk about four steps. So. Uh, the first thing that we have to do is we have to initialize those matrices. Um, so there are a few ways that we can do this. Um, now, you could just start with completely random guesses. You could say, these, this profile is a random jumble of these readings, and all these manuscripts are just have random makeup uh, from these groups. And the method will improve that as well as it can. But generally, if you're going to start with random starting points, uh, it's a good idea to run this method several times because you want to be able to explore the search space as thoroughly as possible. Um, alternatively, you could use an educated guess. Uh, 
so you could use you, you could fill these uh, matrices manually with data that you found in the literature or you could use a, a computer heuristic to intelligently derive values for them based on your original collation matrix and uh, that latter approach is actually the one that i used for my research and it worked rather well so uh, the next step is the step where uh, we freeze that profile composition matrix and we update our manuscript composition matrix. And what's going on under the hood there is really what we do when we apply the quantitative method. We say, given this set of informative readings for classification, I want you to classify these manuscripts as accurately as you can using them. And then in step three, you just swap the matrices around and do the same thing. Uh, and in this case, what you're doing is what the Claremont profile method does. You're saying, given these established manuscript groups, I want you to identify for me which readings are the most significant for those groups. And then you just repeat those two steps over and over again, because at each step, you're actually improving the accuracy of your approximation. Um, and you keep doing that until you can't improve it anymore. So that circular relationship actually does work out in your favor. Um, the caveat, of course, is that uh, it's possible that you'll you'll get only a locally optimal assignment, which um, is another way of saying like if you do start with random guesses, you might only explore part of the search space and not find the best possible solution, but just a stable one. Okay, so to test the effectiveness of this method, uh, I ended up applying it to Tommy Wasserman's collation Jude. Now. You know, before you balk at that, I know that Jude is one of the smallest books, but it is one with a very thorny textual history, too. Uh, and of the 560 manuscripts that Wasserman collated, he was able to find over 1,300 different variant readings just in this tiny book. So you kind of see what, what happens sometimes in textual criticism and, and what we, you know, the embarrassing wealth that we, we have to work with. Um, one thing that is important to do uh, sort of as a pre-processing step is to set aside fragmentary manuscripts from consideration. Um, fragmentary manuscripts are manuscripts that are very lacunose and they, they don't have a lot of known readings. So uh, the reason that we do that is because since the goal of this approach is to reconstruct the original collation matrix as well as possible, minimizing error, um, it becomes harder to do that when there are gaps in the data. Um, and they, if there are enough of them, they can skew the results. So it's good to set those aside and they can be handled later, but I'll talk about that near the end of the presentation. So now the next important question is, uh, since we probably don't know how many groups we want to be looking for, how do we figure out how many we're supposed to specify? Uh, well, before I answer that question, I'll just sort of give a, a, a disclaimer. There's not necessarily one absolutely correct answer. Partly this depends on the application. So if you wanted to just distinguish the, uh, the later bulk of Byzantine manuscripts from the other manuscripts that you find more interesting, then you can get away with just using two groups because usually that's how it will split up. But for our purposes, we would probably want something, like we want smaller, finer groups. And so we'll probably want something more in the neighborhood of like five to 15 or 20 groups. Um, and the process of figuring out which one is the best is called rank estimation. And we kind of evaluate the fitness of different numbers of groups according to several factors. So two of these factors are what we would call sparsity factors. And just to give a quick and dirty definition for what sparsity is, uh, it's just a measure of how little overlap you have between your profiles. So in the, uh, in the profile composition matrix, we would say that uh, we have high sparsity, which is a good thing, when most of the readings belong to one profile only, which makes sense intuitively because we want to have more of those primary profile readings um, and maybe some secondaries, but not ones that are spread over all the profiles. Um, similarly, uh, for the manuscript composition matrix, uh, high sparsity corresponds to a low degree of mixture in the manuscripts. And that also is intuitive because we would expect contamination to be the exception rather than the rule. 
Now, um, the final sort of uh, factor that we can use to measure the fitness of groups is a long one. It's called the cophonetic correlation coefficient. Um, but you don't need to memorize it. There's not going to be a quiz after. Um, so just I, I won't even mention it very much after this. But what that measures is uh, it essentially measures how uh, consistently pairs of manuscripts get grouped together or grouped separately when you uh, you start over with a bunch of different random starting points and run the method several times. And the idea behind this is that if you choose a number of groups that captures some underlying structure in the data, you should expect to get consistent results when you apply this method. And you also notice that uh, I, I've drawn a little uh, gray line here at 13 groups. And the main reason for that is because you see that there's a peak here at the uh, sparsity of the uh, at the sparsity of the matrix or the manuscript composition matrix. So there appears to be very little mixture or the least mixture at this number of groups. Um, there's also a tiny bump in the cofinetic correlation coefficient, but that's less important. So here's the more exciting part. Uh, when I ran non-negative matrix factorization with 13 groups, I found that uh, many of the groups that the method identified were recognizable. Uh, they'd been established in earlier literature. So uh, the first three of these are Byzantine subgroups. Um, the Byzantine text is large, but it's not monolithic. Uh, von Soden identified three groups in the Catholic epistles and non-negative matrix factorization gets all of them. First one is the Kappa group, which is the largest. Second one is the Kappa R group, which is a little bit later, um, but very uniform. And the Kappa C group, which is a little bit more subtle and a little bit harder to detect using other methods. Uh, another thing that we found out, thanks to Tommy Wasserman, including lectionaries in his collation data, is that the, uh, the lectionary tradition, uh, it, the lectionaries have a distinctive text in Jude. So all those, uh, all those church Bibles that you would use for corporate reading, uh, they actually have their own unique features that set them apart. Similarly, uh, the commentaries of pseudo Acumenius and Theodoret uh, have unique textual features that merit them their own group as well. Uh, these last two groups uh, on this slide are, they're, they're Byzantine-ish groups, um, but as far as I could tell, these hadn't been identified elsewhere in the literature. So these ones were, were new to me. Um, and I don't have much else to say about them. Uh, the only thing I do know is, is for the, uh, this last small group here, the two final manuscripts in it, 0142 and 056, are majuscule commentaries. Um, and they're so closely related that they're believed to be either sister manuscript or, or one is the parent of the other. So now we move on to uh, six other groups, which are non-Byzantine. Uh, the first one needs very little introduction. Uh, these are the Alexandrian manuscripts. Um, and this is where a lot of our earliest manuscripts belong. Uh, we have Codex Vaticanus uh, from the fourth century. We have Papyrus 72 from even earlier. Uh, we have a lot of other familiar faces from here and uh, throughout the New Testament uh, that are highly esteemed for their text. Joey, can I ask a question at this point? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is the order of, of your manuscripts in these tables, does that matter at all? Or is it, or is it? Oh, yes, thank you for asking. It does. Uh, they, are, they are sorted by their coefficients um, of contribution from that profile. So, okay. so O3 is kind of more important to that group, we'd say, or it's kind of a... Yes, so that's, that's one of the flagship Alexandrian manuscripts here. Sorry, I should have clarified that earlier. Thank you for That's pointing okay. that out. Make sure. um, after this, we have three smaller groups that uh, have all been identified in the literature as well. Uh, the, these are Family 453, Family 1739, and Family 2138, uh, also called the Harklian group uh, due to its uh, affinity to the Harklian Syriac translation of the New Testament. Um, and these groups all have a presence, uh, not only in the Catholic epistles, but also in the Pauline epistles and in Acts. Uh, the last two groups are a little bit more interesting just because I'm not sure what to do with them. Uh, the second to last group uh, has a lot of manuscripts that von Soden classified in his Iota group. Now, 
in the Gospels, uh, these would correspond to uh, Western and Caesarean manuscripts, but those groups are not believed to have a substantial presence or any presence at all in the Catholic epistles. So it's not clear to me, you know, if that's what this group really represents or if it's something else. Uh, and then the same thing is true for the final group here. Um, I don't know much about these manuscripts together, but I do know that the two leading manuscripts, 915 and 88, are very closely related, not just here, but uh, in the Pauline epistles and in Acts as well. Um, so <laughs> they actually share some interesting readings elsewhere. Um, so in 1 Corinthians 14, for example, um, those two verses where Paul's talking about women keeping silence in church, uh, these two manuscripts, along with a few older Western manuscripts, take those two verses and transpose them to the end of the chapter. And uh, that has led some scholars to believe that maybe those verses were not original to Paul, um, which is a very interesting discussion, but not one that we have time for today. <coughs> uh, time permitting, what I would like to do is talk about uh, some unpublished results that I got when I applied the same method to Bruce Morrill's collation of the continuous text manuscripts of John 18. Um, and I think this will be of some value because this actually highlights some of the places where the method kind of trips up on the data and uh, some steps that we can take to mitigate that and uh, get more expected results from it. Um, the only other thing I have to say about the collation is uh, that it is a larger data set than Wasserman's was, uh, not so much in terms of the number of variant readings, but in terms of uh, the number of manuscripts, because it has about three times as many as uh, Wasserman had in Jude. So it's probably because of the sheer volume of, of manuscripts, but it's also likely due to the high degree of similarity, especially between the Byzantine manuscripts and the Gospels, um, that we get some weird results when we uh, apply, apply uh, non-negative matrix factorization to the collation matrix as is. So what happens is we first do identify different Byzantine groups as we would expect, but then instead of sort of branching out and finding other groups, what non-negative matrix factorization does is it takes this core set of readings common to all of the Byzantine groups and it says, oh, well, I'm gonna call this its own profile and set it over here. And you know, in a sense that's valid because it does you know, increase the sparsity of the profile, but it doesn't really help us for what we want to do because it also makes it look like all of the Byzantine manuscripts uh, share mixture with this group that doesn't actually have any of its own manuscripts. So um, this, this really is uh, the result of how non-negative matrix factorization prioritizes reconstructing the data because uh, the Byzantine groups and their readings form such a large block of that original collation matrix uh, it is important to the method to make sure it reconstructs those as accurately as possible. And that's why it probably focuses on this before identifying other groups. But there is a way to solve it. Uh, and what I ended up doing was I ended up using a, a pre-processing trick that's used uh, in other applications of non-negative matrix factorization. And it's called inverse document frequency weighting or IDF weighting. Now, the math behind it is right here, but I'll just uh, explain what's happening. So uh, in a normal collation matrix, we would just have entries that are zeros and ones. But uh, when we apply this weighting, uh, we actually scale those entries based on how frequently they occur in manuscripts. So for a reading that occurs in most of the tradition, it would get a very small weight. But for a reading that occurs in a smaller part of the tradition, it would get a larger weight. Um, and this really kind of matches our intuition of, of how or which readings are more informative, right? So um, really common readings don't tell us much about differentiation. Uh, rare readings have a lot more discriminatory power. Um, of course, more pre-processing is needed because you know, singular readings being the most weak readings of all, would get a very high weight here and might throw off things. So it, it's usually helpful to do the pre-processing that we would do for other methods and discard them 
Um, but when we apply this, uh, we do see that the results are significantly improved. So on the left-hand plot here, you'll see uh, the results that we get when we don't apply this uh, reweighting to our original collation matrix. And you'll see that the, uh, the sparsity um, of our uh, manuscript composition matrix stays pretty low throughout the whole time. And it's because of that phenomenon I was telling you in the last slide. Um, a lot of those Byzantine manuscripts are being mixed with their common core. Um, but after we apply this weighting, that problem goes away because those most common readings have a very low contribution, don't need to be constructed as well. So what happens now is we, we do have a much higher sparsity and we identify uh, different groups a lot more readily. Um, and also we find readings that are a lot more unique for their profiles and more informative. So I ended up going with 12 groups here in John 18. Um, it's a little bit more arbitrary in this case because as you saw in the plots there, there weren't really any obvious peaks. Um, so other numbers would have worked here, but I went with 12 because I was able to identify most of the or most of the groups that occur here uh, with that that number of groups. So as in Jude, the Byzantine text is uh, broken down into subgroups again, and we identify three of them. So the first one is the Kappa X group, which is the largest one in the Gospels. Um, that Kappa R group, which is late but uniform, shows up again here in the Gospels. Uh, and we also have a a group which is believed to represent an earlier stratum of the Byzantine text type. Um, we also notice that uh, Theophylact's commentaries on John uh, get their group because they have enough unique textual features to kind of earn them their own group. Um, and then moving down, we see that uh, two groups that were identified by Wissa and Luke, Family 16 and Family 1216, uh, get lumped together in one group in John by non-negative matrix factorization. Uh, these are also Byzantine subfamilies, but uh, they're believed to have some earlier features. Uh, and then moving on, we have another Byzantine-ish group uh, that is composed of two other groups that Wiss identified in Luke. M27, which is more of like a lectionary leaning Byzantine text, and uh, cluster 1531, which I didn't know much about, but was identified in Luke. <clears throat> now, when we turn to the non-Byzantine group, something very interesting happens right out the gate. We don't just have one Alexandrian group anymore. It gets fractured. Um, and for lack of a better name, I called the first group the Egyptian group as two of its leading members either are believed or at one point were believed to have originated in Egypt. Um, but we can also see that uh, there's a, some Western manuscripts in here as well B is a number five here that uh, falls into this group as well as a relatively strong member. Now, the second Alexandrian group is, is the one that's more properly called the Alexandrian group for historical reasons. Uh, namely, three of its leading members, manuscripts 1820, 2129, and 1819, all happen to be uh, copies of Cyril of Alexandria's commentary on John. It seems to represent his text. Uh, following this, we have two well-known groups in the Gospels, Family 1 and Family 13. And then we have uh, two other groups that are composed of one or more groups identified by Wissa and Luke. Again, these are less familiar to me, so I, I don't have too much to say about them here. Um, oh. But uh, these results uh, merit some, some concluding observations. Uh, and I'm going to talk about something interesting that happens with Codex Vaticanus here um, as an instructive example. So over here to the right, you can see a cross section of that manuscript composition matrix um, where you have the profiles here in the rows and then here's the column for Vaticanus. But what you see is that it has an almost even contribution from these two groups, which you know, we might think would suggest mixture, but this seems to be a very odd conclusion to reach because of the manuscript we're talking about. So there are two important things to know about Vaticanus. One is that it's very early. Um, it is a fourth century manuscript and one of the earliest we have. Secondly, 
uh, it is very highly esteemed by textual critics and it is believed to preserve um, a lot of uh, original or good readings faithfully. So mixture seems like it would be out of character here. And in fact, that may be, it may not be correct. Um, so on the left-hand side of this bottom illustration, you can see that one way we could interpret these results is as the result of mixture. But another way we can interpret it is that Vaticanus, uh, by virtue of its old age and by virtue of the isolation it experiences due to its old age, may represent uh, an early of the text before later accretions uh, kind of distinguished two different parts of it. Um, so more of the Alexandrian features came later and more of the Egyptian features occurred in later manuscripts. And those sort of formed the majority of those groups and so classified those groups better. Um, so. Can I ask a question, Joey? Absolutely. Um, so I, I can't remember what you call it, but the, the, the feature of your non-negative matrix factorization that determines how many groups you create. Yeah. Um, did you try any where you didn't have the split between what you're calling Alexandrian and Egyptian? in John 18. Um, like I just wonder if there's another you know, number of those. You said, I think you had, said you had 12 groups for John 18. Yeah. Time. Like if so, you reduce that to six, or like how far down do we have to reduce that number before those two, Alexander and Egyptian, actually are the same? I would have to check. I mean, there, there's going to be a point where that does happen. Sure. Um, just wonder and, if you read when it does. Yeah, I, I, don't. I could always look at some of my data sets. Um, okay. After after we're done here, because um, I have them on hand. Okay. Um, but really, like what this what this issue highlights about the method is that uh, it, it isn't designed to answer the question of which which of these scenarios happened. Um, it is a pre genealogical approach and not a genealogical one. And if you remember that distinction that we made way at the beginning of this uh, talk. Um, that means that it can describe the degree of similarity of things, but it doesn't tell us anything about the direction of the relationships between manuscripts or groups. So um, the upside to that limitation is that we have to make a lot fewer assumptions about our data going in. And we also don't have to do a lot of the hard work of making text critical judgments about readings. Um, and for that purpose, uh, this approach is very well suited for the earlier steps in putting together a critical text of the New Testament. Because usually what you want to do earlier on is you want to identify good representative manuscripts of different branches of the textual history. And you also want to identify you know, the points of variation that highlight their differences. And non-negative matrix factorization does a really good job of identifying both of those things. Um, it also has other uses as well. So if you discovered a new manuscript or if you wanted to classify some of those fragmentary manuscripts that you set aside at the beginning, um, you can take out that uh, profile composition matrix that you got from training the method on complete data and then use that with, your, uh, with the manuscript in question to figure out how best to group it. Um, and yeah, I think... Uh, other than that, just the final plug. Um, I uh, am continuing to work with this method, but I uh, was very privileged recently to have uh, Dr. Maurice Robinson contact me and ask me if I'd be interested in applying it to his collation of about 2000 manuscripts in the Pericope Adultra. Um, and that's really exciting, not just for the scope of that data set, but also because it will be very interesting to see how the results that I get compared to his intuition on what those groups would look like. And I'm sure it'll be very interesting and maybe someday I'll get to tell you about it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, does, is that, does that data exist in electronic form or is it on paper? Um, it's in PDFs it? right now. I'm working on getting it into a more machine readable form. Okay. I thought last time I, last time I asked if it was still on, it was still yeah. on paper, <laughs> but I'm glad to hear it's digital now. <laughs> it's in, the, it's in <laughs> process. Yeah. I'm not there yet. Good. That's great. Uh, anything more, Joey? Or that is the end of the presentation. Okay. Um, so, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, Joey. It's really awesome. For those, I didn't. I don't know if you mentioned the beginning, but 
Uh, Joey, could you tell them where your article is that just came out? On oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so this work got published in uh, Andrews University Seminary Studies uh, right here. Um, it's a, uh, and you should be able to find it online um, and it should be like freely accessible if you just click the download button at the top of its page. Um, the top download button. Is not the Andrews what? University website somewhere? Or is it on yeah, it, um, I think it's like the, it's the Andrews University Seminary Studies website. Um, and it should be on the, uh, the table of contents page for the current issue. Okay, great. So uh, you guys can follow up on that. All right. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Have you yeah. experimented with adding any metadata to the matrix factorization to weight it towards favoring, like, say, a specific text type or anything like that? Or is it strictly just been textual? Um, this is strictly textual. Um, and I mean, because it's sort of pre-genealogical, like you, you can't really enforce any rules about, about earlier things having more priority. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I mean, like you could also, one way you could handle it would be if you populated the initial matrices yourself um, by starting with the groupings that you expected to find and then seeing how it would modify those. Yeah, I'd almost be curious about working the algorithm in reverse where we started with kind of what we know about these manuscripts, when they were written, and mm -hmm. almost working backwards towards the model that you're using now, using that to kind of inform our understanding of the individual manuscripts. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, this is a good question. If you yeah. Don't have you don't have an immediate answer. It's a good question. <laughs> no, I don't. You want to follow up on that? Or? No, that's, that's, that's okay. all I got. Right that's, that's all I got. That's good though. All right. Anybody else? All right. Oh, well, Joey, we're going to let you go if that's okay, because I got to let these uh, have a break. But um, can we thank Joey? Jason, thank you very much, Joey.